Dan Bublitz Comedy Productions. My friend Dan, he's got a podcast, cause all comics need a podcast, and nobody had a podcast called The Art of Bombing, so Dan went out and bought a tape deck, who knows why he bought a tape deck, now cast don't get played on tape decks, but Dan is from the 80s, so hey there all you funny jerks, come talk to Dan about your work, tell him all about your worst times, it's The Art of Bombing. Welcome to an all-new Art of Bombing Presents Between Bombs, where Josh and I call back the most recent episode, and th this week we are recalling episode 283 with Kira McKaylin, and uh, it was a great conversation. It was a yeah. fun conversation. I was glad that we were able to have that conversation. We actually had to reschedule a couple times, but we got it nailed down. Yeah, got it. Got it in the books, on the docket, in the bank, out to the, your earwaves, <laughs> <laughs> hot off the press. <laughs> Wait, we, what did we miss? Uh, ready for consumption? Hot out of the oven? Right out of the Pressed? microwave? <laughs> uh, that's that's where stuff's gonna come from tonight, man. I'm... <laughs> One of them nights tonight, huh? Yeah, Just, uh, it's a blockbuster night at, at my house. Uh, oh, oh, blockbuster yeah. night. Movie night means cooking the microwave. <laughs> uh -huh. That's right. Yeah, I, I just realized a lot of our listeners are not going to know what making it a blockbuster night really is. Uh, I know, right? Oh, you got to be a certain age to understand that reference. <laughs> you know what? We'll wait right here while you guys look that up. Here we go. Okay. And while hey, and while you're looking that up. This is a good opportunity to go back and listen to episode 283 with Kira if you haven't already. That's right. All right. Now that you you, know, you looked up to find out what it means to have a blockbuster night, and hopefully you went and listened to the episode with Kira, you're all caught up to speed, Where and we can go. proceed. <laughs> we are hot off the press. We can keep these wheels <laughs> turning. <laughs> oh man a lot of stuff in this episode I, I i appreciated that like yes she's a comic she does stand-up comedy had stories that apply to stand-up comedy but she's seeing it through the lens of a graphic artist so yep we've talked a number of times about how you know you want that adjacent kind of you know uh like you got to use your creativity in different ways to make it as a as a stand-up comic and she's literally doing that and her deal is the, you know, a few episodes ago, we had somebody who was in a similar kind of uh, kind of lifestyle. But in her world, she's got a web comic coming out and mm -hmm. she's really pouring herself into the graphic side of things. And so yep. just a little As, bit different. Re it is, absolutely. And it's, it's cool because while it's outside, it's not stand up comedy. It's still comedy adjacent because a lot of what like her her web comic that she has that she puts out on a regular basis is her taking stand up and humor and putting it into those web comics yeah yeah so i totally good, have a lot good, of appreciation yeah it's a good tool I, that's all i was going to say for for keeping uh, keeping the writing skills sharp yeah yeah right like in, in my in my teaching and stuff, I use a lot of my stand up comedy. So it's not like when I spend time working on a joke and working it out, it's not like going to there's going to be equity in doing that. And I yeah. so that's why I had a, a special appreciation for um, for what you just said. Now, it's interesting that you talk about using comedy to teach because, you know, in this episode, we talk a little bit about that. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about is how, like you said, you can use comedy when you're teaching things, but it's hard to teach and preach while doing comedy. Yes. It, the opposite of, of that is <laughs> it, it's an interesting how there's two different sides of that. How Right comedy it's can interesting be used. it is very interesting it's very like intriguing it's so what is your take so so let's let's put a magnifying glass on comedy and why suddenly audiences are not okay when we start to preach or teach this comes up in the episode and i wanted to start yep. here because our listeners have heard that already so what do you 
What's your take on that? Why does that happen? Why does that bring the room to a grinding halt? I think uh, because, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of it is because pe when people come to a comedy show, they're coming to forget about that, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're coming to free themselves from their lives and real life. And it's an escape. And when you start preaching or trying to teach something, you, you're you're making them, you know, most of the time those topics are topics that everybody knows about. So it, it has the opposite effect. They're not forgetting about life. They're being reminded of it. Oh, and they're coming wow. here yeah. to, you know, forget about that for a little bit. They just want to be entertained. They don't want, you know, to, to have a lesson. And I think it is possible to, you know, especially when you talk about like social commentary and things like that, where there is a way of having a lesson within the joke and use, you know, kind of teaching. But I think there's you have to have a really strong skill set. I mean, Carlin was great at that. He was very good at pointing out Correct. things with a social with social commentary and making observations and it still be humorous. But a lot of times if you watch, if you go back and watch his stuff, you're going to see that he didn't necessarily like when he made points and stuff might not have got laughter, but it was getting clapped -er. And that's, you know, something I picked up from uh, the Daily Comedy podcast uh, that they how he differentiates that is where, you know, you tell a joke, people laugh, you make a statement that people get behind and you get that uh, that clapter where it's an applause, not because not because it was necessarily funny, but whatever you said resonated, you know, resonated. Yeah. Yeah. And with with Carlin, I think he's another example of something else we've done in one of these callbacks, which is. You can't do what the greats do or what well-known comics can get yep. away with. It's, it's, it's different. And I think a lot of people fall into the trap of breaking the expected sort of tacit or verbal contract that people expect when they show up to a comedy show and then mm -hmm. suddenly – there's a lesson or I love how you said it. Like it reminds them of life when they thought that that wasn't going to happen. And you're doing it because you saw Carlin do it on your favorite mm -hmm. special that he does. You know, there's other comics that do that too. Louis CK and Chappelle, like there are, yeah. there's social commentary. That's part of what they do. But if you go back and watch the early stuff, there's probably not nearly as much of that there, you know, like mm -hmm. as they're emerging, just like all of us, we kind of have to stay in that expected, the boundary of the contract. Yep. Oh, and we've talked about this before as well. You know, I think also it's important that before you can really get into that, you need to build likability. It's just like anything. It's yeah. just like going blue, you know, or saying something, you know, that has shock value before an audience is going to get behind it or, you know, at least be open to listening to it. They need to know that, you know, they need to trust you. They need to have that likability, so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you can't establish likability when you're, you know, going straight into the, this is the lesson that I want you to know. But yep, when when you were delivering this topic, like you mentioned something that I think's uh, pretty important, which is the, when it's the other way around, it's totally fine. Yeah, yeah. When you take any other topic that you're trying to teach and then you make it funny and, and entertaining, chances are too the people who are supposed to be receiving the information are going to be more receive, you know, they're going to better receive that information. Yeah. Right. Like I've, I've been kind of thinking about something a lot recently, which is, you know, who, who needs me more? Like where, where am I going to make the bigger impact? Like I, I have this kind of duality where I do comedy, um, but I also do teaching and, and a lot of corporate stuff. And so I've been like, and in episode intros, when we talk about what we got going on, I'm a lot more quiet over the last <laughs> few months because I've been doing these corporate talks and gigs and, and things like that. That Because the, my, my question is, well, who needs me more? And it may be that the, the, the corporate folks do. The corporate folks need me more. And that's really where I can make 
a bigger impact and, you know, bringing comedy and some enjoyment into a workplace or a workplace dialogue. I, I feel like that gives me more freedom as a performer and as a person to teach, which is something that I like to do, but also have the comedy angle to it to make what I'm teaching more powerful. And I couldn't do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. That's, I don't know. It's an interesting, <clears throat> I'm just realizing right now that that you can't toe the line both ways. Yeah, it is. It's very intriguing. And I, I can tell just from experience, you know, the, the teachers that I had growing up, the ones that were more impactful to me yeah. and were the ones that were funny and entertaining yeah. and, and made the lessons fun, you know? Right. <clears throat> Cause when you tell a joke, like there's like, you know, as a comic, Dan, like if your joke falls flat and nobody laughs and you're by, I never tell jokes that that's fall never flat. happened to you before. <laughs> if, if some other comic were to do that, then I'm a pro job. You are an expert at all levels. Uh, so <laughs> if you know a, a joke falls flat no one's laughing at a joke it's not personal it's not that they don't like you it's that they don't understand yep there's they don't understand the premise so laughter is the ultimate confirmation that of listening and connecting to people and i think if you're teaching and you're able to insert jokes and entertainment and amusement into what you're doing and people are laughing at it, then that, then your message, your teaching message is, is just contained inside of that loop mm -hmm. and people are confirming that the message is landing on them and it's having an impact on them and it, where you can totally give a, a talk about, uh, you know, whatever your profession is and, and go in and people can learn something and never laugh at it either. But there's no real confirmation for you, the, the speaker, that that's happening without using laughter. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great point. And I, that was well said. It really was it, well said. You know, and then another thing that we're going to talk about, I think that's good for that. That's a good way to close that that topic, that talking point. I don't know that I could add anything to what you already said, but we also wanted to talk about how we push ourselves to get better. And that's, you know, as performers, as people, you know, humans, the whole nine yards, what are things yeah. you do to push yourself? Especially now, now you're in this corporate world, you're, you're teaching, you're adding humor to get better at teaching and using those methods. What are some other things you do to push yourself? Um, well, I think the first place to look is like, am I being limited by any of the beliefs that I have? Mm -hmm. Like, like, do, you know, am, am I holding myself back because I don't think I could do this thing if I tried? So I think the first place to look, you know, for how to push yourself is to challenge those beliefs and ideas. Like, am I not doing this because I lack the skill? Am I not telling this joke because I lack the skill or doing crowd work? I think that's probably a good example for a lot of our listeners. Like, am I not trying cloud, crowd work because I don't know how to do it or because I'm scared? Mm -hmm. or because I tell myself over and over again, I'm not a crowd work comic. Yeah. Which Let is me ask nice you this. How important do you think crowd work is? Especially if you're a newer comedian. The reason I, I, I bring this up, with, you know, this is a good transition into this, but I had this conversation with a comic that's only a couple years in on a way to a show last yeah. week that we were talking about this. And, you know, one of the points that I was trying to make is, you know, a lot of the crowd work that people do that, you know, they'll they'll claim to be good at crowd work. But they're, you know, I'm sorry if you're asking the same three questions that every other comic is asking. Yeah. You know, what do you do for a living? What's your name? What's that like? That's not great crowd work. I mean, that, again, that's just my opinion. If you're a comic listening and that's your idea of great crowd work, I guess, you know good for i guess that's your prerogative i, I will always i will die on my hill <laughs> mm -hmm. and i would also recommend if you because i recommended this to that comic too if you really truly want to do crowd work and be that crowd work comic go watch some comics who are really good at crowd work one that i would recommend is russell hicks phenomenal comic started in san diego moved to the uk 
just his crowd work is it, it's it, it's unmatched really it's insane yeah. but what do you think well i, I think uh a comic on your level, somebody who's headlining places is, I think it's up to you to choose what you do and, and, and how to, how to, you know, you're in, you're in charge of entertaining the room. And if crowd works, a strength that you can, you can lean on and that you like doing it, do it. But mm-hmm. is term in terms of a new comic, I think it's very important as long as you recognize the proper definition of crowd work. I think what you're saying, you're, you're describing these same rote questions that I asked the same audience over and over again, or even worse that the audience in front of me has already been asked several times in the night. To me, that's the opposite of crowd work. Good crowd work is living in the moment. Like if you've, you know, if like somebody asked the same guy who, you know, uh, does roofing for a living and they make roofing jokes all night. And then I come up and say, I bet you're tired of these roofing jokes. Who's, who else is tired of like this guy's roofing life? Like, I'm getting bored. Maybe that's kind of an example of like breaking the pattern of mm-hmm. what's been happening because you heard it in the room. Like s- some of the best moments I've ever had crowd work wise have all been in response to what's going on around me because the audience also sees it. And there's no way to script it. And I think that's why a lot of comics are afraid of it and or tell themselves that they're not really crowd work comics so that they don't have to do it so that they don't get better at it because they're not good crowd work. You know, like this loop. Yeah. Well, yeah, I would probably be in that. I don't think I'm good at crowd work, but I also to me, I don't care because I'm not trying to be a crowd work comedian. You know, that's why I, you know, I write and polish my material I'm coming to want to do that. Sure. If things happen in the moment, you know, I try to be present and go with it, but I'm not intentionally going out of my way to do crowd work. And I think a lot of, and I think that's a, a a skill set that every comic should have. You should be able to handle crowds and be in the moment and things like that. And, you know, crowd work definitely helps you with uh, handling hecklers and things like that. But I also think when you're early on in comedy, before you can, before you, unless you're, you've had experience in improv prior to this, you need to know how to write a joke and work on your joke structure and, and, and having solid material before you worry about being a a good crowd work comedian. Yeah. But I think you made a great point about that, that what people think is crowd work is the opposite. And that's, that's, I think, spot on. Yeah. 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 You're going to develop as a comic, but I think this is the the total crux of what we're talking about, which is you have to explore these areas to know if it can add something to your act. Mm-hmm. You've been doing Absolutely. this long enough to where you've explored it enough and gone. I, I don't necessarily enjoy crowd work that yep. much. I got it if I need it. Yep. But I don't really enjoy it that much. I don't do it. Yeah. Right? And I've tried like I personally, I've tried all kinds of I've done a very experimental comedy. I've tried all kinds of things to see what fit, what I liked, what I didn't like. You know, a lot of it was terrible, didn't stick. You know, I tried musical comedy. I'm not a musician. You know, I've I've had some poetry, like funny poetry that I tried and that. Some of that went fine. But yeah, over all in all, you know, like it, you're right. You just have to work on, you know, what works for you and, and, and follow that through. Right. And that, right. that's a good, and that's a good way to push yourself to evolve is trial and error. You know, yeah. that's a great, you know, just try some things. And if it doesn't work, no big deal, no harm, no foul. As long as you do it in a low stakes scenario, you know, like if yeah. I'm going to experiment with something new that could totally bomb, I'm probably not going to do it at a sold out show or I'm getting paid money to be there. Exactly. You know, I'm probably going to go try this at an open mic where nobody's paying attention anyway. <laughs> right. Or where you are in the order of a sold out show. Right. So if you're featuring. Oh, that's a good point. A sold out show, you are going to bring you're going to bring the pain. You're going to bring the good stuff. But mm-hmm. if you got a five minute set and it's a guest spot and you're passing through, now, let's make sure that it's a good show and it's funny, but let's also, you can take some risks in that spot 
And it's not that bad if you do, because, you know, you want the show to build and for the acts to get better as you go. No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I'm always trying to to improve. I, I'm a huge believer in continuous improvement. Anybody that listens to this podcast and has listened to this podcast for a long time, you yeah. already know that we've we've been continually working to improve this podcast over the years. It's evolved tremendously. I, you know, I have that same aspect in my personal life, you know, my, my professional life, you know, comedy, always trying to push to be better. Uh, and some of the things that, you know, one of the things I'm trying to get better about is, you know, writing, getting better writing structure. I need to, you know, I've been working on thinking of ideas of how to, you know, to sit down and actually hash out jokes, you know, like I'm good at thinking about ideas and working it out in my head, but I'm trying to get to where I'm actually, hey, I'm going to sit down, do the thing and actually, you know, put the work in. Well, one of the ways that I've done that, you know, started to do that is, you know, with that not to, I know it's three weeks in a row, but the gig diary, I, I can't stop raving about it because it's a good incentive to get me to try to write things and and pay closer attention to my sets when I perform, mm -hmm. you know, Great. where yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't uh, paying as close attention as I should have been, but I am now. So that's yep. one, that's like one thing that I've been doing for that to try to get better. That's a great ingredient for growth. You can accelerate your ability to grow at anything. As long as you're, if you've got the professional humility to mm -hmm. sit through a recording of you messing up or being yep. willing to revisit that. Yep. Big well, time. and I think it's important too, you know, when when you're thinking about what you need to grow and evolve as a performer or you know in anything finding the right tools that work for you too i want to point that out there yeah i'm raving about this gig diary wendy is a good friend of mine but that's i i actually she put out a really good tool mm -hmm. it, it's very useful i find it very useful you listening you might not and that's fine but maybe you have something else that works better for you and there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, if you find a tool that works for you, make sure you're utilizing it. Utilize all the tools that you can if it's going to help make you better and evolve as a performer and a writer. Right. You know, I think we covered a lot here, Dan. Yeah, we did. I just want to do just a couple quick things with that, you know, ways that you can improve your writing using daily writing prompts you know, yeah. spend five, 10 minutes a day writing, use a writing prompt, you know, listening back to your sets, taking notes on your sets, develop your own writing set, uh, your rating system for your jokes. When you listen back, you know, maybe it's a one through five score based on the laughter. You know, we've talked, there's, we've got plenty of episodes. If you go back into the vault, there's plenty of episodes of us talking about different methods for, you know, using data to improve and things like that when you listen back to your set. So yeah, use all the tools that you can and uh, yeah, let's keep getting better together. Baby. That's right folks. Every right. day, every day we getting better. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of between moms callbacks. We'll be back next week with another fantastic episode. Our guest next week is Mandy Kay, a fantastic comedian from Denver, Colorado. So, uh, yeah, keep, uh, keep listening and uh, have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. This has been a Dan Bublitz comedy production. 